Let's start with a gentle introduction to the Japanese writing system. And we only have 30 minutes, so I'm going to keep it really simple. So here is a sentence in uh, Japanese. And the color's off. But anyway, so this part here is called uh, katakana. This part here, they're called hiragana. And then the dark parts are kanji. So kanji, they come in uh, sort of two types. You can put them together and make uh, complex kanji. And also, uh, you can uh, look at kanji as individual characters. So today's presentation, we will look at kanji as individual characters. So let me tell you a little bit about kanji. It's an ancient uh, logographic writing system that originally comes from China. It's thousands of years old. You can look at one kanji as being a word or concept, but you can also put them together to make new words. So for example, this kanji here means stop, and this kanji means electricity. And if you put them together, that means a blackout, so when a city has no electricity. But if you put them together in another order, it becomes a tram stop. So makes sense, right? Uh, there's a thousand kanji that kids learn in, uh, in primary school, and they learn another thousand in in high school. So by the time they finish school, they know 2,000, and that's still not enough to read a newspaper. Kanji is hard. So it's hard to recognize, it's hard to read, hard to pronounce, and also hard to write. And there are many reasons. For this presentation, we'll focus on just one thing. How do you recognize kanji? And I'll save the rest for maybe some other time. So here are some simple examples. The seven kanji you see on the slide now, they correspond to natural elements. So you have the moon, fire, water, tree, gold, earth, and the sun. That also happens to be um, the Japanese characters for uh, weekdays. So if you look at a Japanese calendar, you see these uh, seven guys there. Now, the cool thing with kanji is you often take simple kanji, combine them, to make more complex kanji. And this kind of makes kanji like a little bit of a puzzle which you have to solve, which makes it fun to work with. So for example, you take two moons, you get this. You, take, you add a tree, you get that. Take two trees, you get this, and so on. Another cool thing about kanji is it was originally written with a brush. So it helps knowing how many times you have to touch the paper, uh, brush to the paper to draw the kanji. And that's known as a stroke count. Knowing it is helpful because a lot of the dictionaries will help you, uh, will sort by stroke count, so it allows you to narrow down your search. And obviously, the more uh, strokes there are in a kanji, the, the, the harder it is to write, the more complex it is. So there are thousands of kanji news. How do you remember them? The first thing you need to do is to learn to refer to these things. And if you don't speak Japanese, how do you do it? I mean, there's this pentagon-looking thing, and then there's this thing, and if you put them together, you get this thing. Calling them this thing gets really old really quickly. So what you need to do is you got to cheat. You assign an English keyword to each kanji. So this keyword may be related to the meaning of the kanji, but it doesn't have to be. It can be anything you want. So if you call this metal, and you call this lose, you call this iron. Then what you do is you make up a story that connects those three things. So something stupid like iron is an essential metal for the human body, don't lose too much of it. So it sounds stupid, but if you make up good stories and you pick good keywords, it works. So this is known as the HiSig system, and 80% uh, of the time it works all the time. It isn't the only way, um, but it's a good way to start. Another cool thing with kanji is the ability to divide and conquer. So quite often, you'll see kanji, and it will look complex. But if you look closely at it, you'll have parts which you can sort of tell apart easily. So for example, let's look at these for uh, kanji. And I've shown the keywords uh, here. You can actually break them down into recurring parts, like rain, foot, and each. And these three parts, if you put them together, you get Jew. So the stuff that's on the grass in the morning when you, when you go out really early. If you look at the other kanji, 
uh, you'll see other elements like a mouth and a broom and a rice field. So these things, they're called uh, different things depending on who you talk to. In Japanese, the name is bushu. Uh, it's a radical. But bushu is a little bit different, and so are roots and primitive components. So the vocabulary gets a little bit complex. To keep it simple for this presentation, I'm just going to call them parts. So parts of kanji. So a part can be uh, kanji by itself, like for example, rain's a kanji, food is a kanji by itself, or it can be just it only comes as part of another kanji. So this part here and this part on the bottom here, you don't see them as kanji by themselves, at least to the best of my knowledge. So by now you probably have a lot of questions about, um, about kanji. How do we organize them? How do we identify them? How do we break them down? How do we look them up? And how do we avoid doing the hard manual work by ourselves? And the answer is, I'm sorry you can't see that, but with Python. So for this presentation, I will show you uh, some resources uh, with Python, which you can use uh, to play around with kanji, and I'll show you examples. So let me begin with this uh, data set called uh, the HiSeq data set. So it covers approximately 2,000 kanji, and this is what the kids learn in, in school. So for each uh, data set, the data looks like this. You have a kanji, and then you have the keyword for it, and uh, the lesson number and the stroke count. Lesson number comes from here. Uh, they divide the whole uh, 2,000 kanji into 56 lessons, which you can take uh, one at a time, essentially. So uh, we can now refer to 2,000 kanji using an unambiguous English keyword. There's other kanji, which are not covered by this data set, but they are relatively rare, so we can improvise there. So now I'll show you how to use this data set. Okay, that's much better. So here we have the uh, HiSeq data set. Uh, parsing it is relatively straightforward. It's just a couple of lines of Python. And then once you parse it, you get the data that I showed you on the slide. And you can use it to, for example, give, um, give a kanji and get back the keyword for that kanji. So here we have iron, gold, and blues. I call this metal, but yeah, you can call it whatever you want. It doesn't really matter. So another cool thing you can do is you can look at the kanji by the stroke count. So here's a list of kanji that have 13 strokes. And then you can look at the distribution of the stroke count across the uh, kanji data set. So you can see that most kanji in day-to-day -day Japanese use have between 6 and 13, 14 strokes. So they're reasonably complex to write. You can also look at the distribution of the um, number of kanji per lesson. So there's 56 lessons. Each lesson is approximately 20 kanji. Some can be more, some can be less. But this, can, this is something you can handle in a weekend, basically, just by sitting down and learning. The most important part, though, is you want to be able to do this. You want to take a kanji and work out how to say it in English so you can refer to it and communicate with other people and um, once you get the kanji back, you can copy-paste that into a dictionary and do whatever you want. But from this point, you don't actually need to know any Japanese. You can be just playing around with kanji just because you like kanji. Or because you speak some other language which uses kanji, like, for example, Korean, Chinese, to some extent, Vietnamese. So that's the high data set. The next data set is called KRAD. Uh, it decomposes uh, 6,000 kanji into approximately 254 radicals. So the important part to realize is, although there's thousands of kanji, the number of components that make up those kanji and they're recurring is significantly less. So you're not solving a puzzle of 6,000 pieces. You're solving a puzzle of 250, uh, 254 or maybe a couple more pieces. So it's actually doable. So this kanji, uh, this data set takes in kanji, and it tells you which radicals are part of that kanji. So 
the kanji here are on the left. And you can tell that these parts make up the kanji, so it's pretty straightforward. You use this kind of data set for multiple things, um, but I'll be talking about how you can use it to compare kanji to each other and find similar kanji. So going back to our Jupyter uh, notebook, again, parsing uh, these data sets is very simple. And here's the example. Once you parse it, you give it a kanji, and it tells you which radicals are present in that kanji. So using this data set, when you have two kanji, if you want to compare them, you break them down into radicals, so you get two lists, and then you just look at the intersection of those lists. If the intersection is large, then there are many uh, shared radicals, so the kanji will be similar. And if there's no intersection, then they're completely different. So that's also quite trivial once you have the data. You can also look at what the most common radicals are, and you can see them on the screen. So the mouth is by far the most radical, uh, the most common radical, followed by all these strokes, which you can't really call them anything. But then, and the cool thing is, you can do the same thing you did with stroke counts and look at the distribution of radical count across the kanji data set. So here you can see that in the 6,000 kanji data set, most kanji have over three radicals. So again, reasonably complex, but as long as you know what the radicals are, it's, a, it's okay. So here is how you measure similarity between two kanji. You break them down into radicals, and then you look at the intersection of the set. And here you can find results for similar kanji. So given this input kanji, you can see that these kanji are similar to that one. And again, you don't need to know any kanji. You just see that they look similar. So the confusing thing with KRAD is it doesn't look at the position of each radical within the kanji. So what can happen is you'll see, you have collections of radicals uh, that look like this. So given the sun and the tree, Japanese actually has these kanji. So they contain just the sun and just the tree in different arrangements in different counts. So these characters are going to be particularly hard to remember because you have to somehow remember this one is the tree on top and this one's the other way around. There are more examples on the slide, but luckily uh, things like this are not very common. They're more edge cases that you just need to know. So this last data set is called Chiset. It covers over 20,000 kanji, and it decomposes kanji into uh, parts. So going back to our previous example, we have iron on the left, and then this special character, and then metal and lose. And this means metal goes on the left, lose goes on the right, and you get iron. So another example, you have mountain on the top, wind on the bottom, means storm. Uh, this one's a bit more complex, but it still works the same way. So this is known as Polish notation. Um, the, these are operators, and these are operands. So this, the, this character tells you that it's side by side. This one's top to bottom. This one's arranged horizontally. And the cool thing is, these dotted characters are actually Unicode characters that are designed specifically to tell you how to arrange uh, ideographs to make more complex kanji. So when people are making Unicode, 20, over 20 years ago, they thought of this already, so it was pretty good. There's a total of 12 layouts. You can see them all here. And I'll show you an example of using the Chiset data set. So again, parsing it is uh, straightforward with, with Python. It's reasonably expressive. And once you get there, you can give it a dict. Uh, sorry, kanji, and it will give you back the, uh, the parts that are in the kanji, and that's very convenient. And you get that for over 20,000 kanji. So this includes the day-to-day -day kanji and kanji you would probably never see in normal day-to-day -day activity. So because I like histograms, here's the most common uh, layouts in Japanese kanji. And you can see that 
the left-right layout is by far the most common in this sort of esoteric 20,000 kanji data set. If you look at the uh, more common kanji, then left to right is still the most common, but it, the margin decreases to about half. But the most useful part is you can break uh, kanji down into uh, these parts. If you have a complex kanji, you can tell exactly which parts are in it, and you can then search for them. So for example, if you have, if you know that this part on the bottom is called the heart, and this part on the left is called the woman, and this is the mouth, but you don't know what the kanji are, then you can just do a lookup on heart, woman, mouth, and bang, you get that kanji. So this combines the uh, high sig keywords with the GSA data set, and it can be very powerful. So I'll show you why that works well. Quite often, if you're reading a book or a, a website or a newspaper, or you're watching TV, there'll be kanji which you've never seen before. And it happens more frequently for non-native speakers, but I imagine Japanese speakers have the same problem. So here's a challenge. Look up these kanji in a dictionary. Start now. So you have uh, several options. So if you're careful and you saw the link to the presentation, then you can just copy-paste these characters and you're done. But what if you can't copy-paste? All right, well, uh, you know how to pronounce these things, so you can enter them using the IME into a dictionary and then look them up. Okay, but what if you don't know how to pronounce them? It gets tricky. You have to look at the main radical in the kanji and then use that to do a dictionary lookup. Now, the main radical isn't always obvious, so this is a bit tricky and involves trial and error. You can then estimate the stroke count and then reduce the number of kanji you have to manually look through but that's also tedious. If you have a dictionary with handwriting recognition and you know how to write kanji, you can write it into the dictionary, but what if you don't know how to write it? Then you're kind of out of luck. You either have to ask someone or you have to give up. But with Python, you get more options. So if you recognize any of the radicals, then you can look them up by Chise or Krad. So here's an example. So here's the kanji from the slides uh, on the top. And again, if you know that these parts here, that's an ear. And if you know that that's a page, then, and you can input them into your uh, search, then you can look them up easy. But if you can't input them, you know what they're called, you can do exactly the same thing. So you can repeat this approach with all the other kanji that you see. As long as you recognize the parts of the kanji, and the more parts you recognize, the more um, fruitful your search will be, the more exact the results will be. So for example, if you only give it, uh, the less keywords you give it, the more results you'll have to look through, but the results will contain what you want. So this is a useful application of combining uh, the Chise data set, that data set and the HiSeq data set to uh, perform kanji lookups. So I'm going to stop talking about kanji for a little while, and let's talk about graphs. If you haven't seen graphs before, then don't worry. Um, it will be a gentle introduction, and then at the end, I'll show you how we can um, tie graphs back to kanji. So this is an unlabeled graph. These round things, they're called nodes. Um, sometimes they're called vertices or points, but that doesn't matter. And the lines that connect them, they're called um, arcs or edges. So this graph has um, 26 nodes and uh, 17 edges. And it's called unlabeled because you, well, it doesn't have any labels. You don't know which, uh, what each data point corresponds to. So one thing you could see from this graph is some nodes are connected. There's all these nodes are connected together, and then these nodes are connected, and so are these guys, but then you have these singletons here. So what you can automatically do with uh, graph analysis libraries like Network X, you can do a connected component analysis, 
And that will automatically tell you how many connected components your graph has. So in this case, we have nine, and each one is in a separate color. And they're called clusters or groups. So this can tell you how to break up a graph and look at individual parts that are completely separate from each other. So another thing that you could do is if you have an unlabeled graph and you sort of you're happy with how you've shown the structure, you can add labels to it. So here, each uh, node corresponds to kanji, and edges co connect kanji that are related. So for example, the stop, and you have keywords here, um, the stop kanji is related to walk because uh, walk includes stop, so it stops there at the top, and so does forward, so you can see stop there at the top. So visualizing this uh, kanji as a graph can be helpful because it shows you what's related visually. One other thing that I'd like to show about graphs is sometimes they get really complicated um, and hard to visualize because there's a lot of data points and a lot of relationships. Uh, what you have to do in that case is, uh, well, one of the things you could do is uh, take a subgraph. So that just means you remove some nodes and some edges from your graph. So Here's a subgraph of 16 nodes. Uh, it helps you simplify uh, complex graphs. So you go from uh, 26 nodes to 16 nodes. So it's, it's a visualization tool. So let's look at how you can put uh, graphs and kanji together. Oops. Okay, so when you're drawing a graph, the first thing you need to decide is, well, what are your nodes going to be? And what are the edges going to be? And more specifically, how you implement the uh, edge function. So the edge function basically takes two nodes uh, and tells you whether or not they should be connected by an edge. So in our case, we're going to be using the Chisa data set using a simple uh, function. So the output at the bottom shows you if you have these two edges, these two nodes, they should have an edge, and so should these two and these two. But these two shouldn't, because these kanji are not related. They're not, this one doesn't contain this one, and the same thing the other way around. So that makes sense, right? And then you can construct a graph. And when you construct a graph, you pretty much compare the nodes to each other, determine if they need to be connected by edges. And then you can get a graph. Unfortunately, if you try and plot all the kanji on a single graph, you get this. It's a giant ball of mud. It's useless. And the reason why this is so is because kanji are closely related. So each kanji is related to some other kanji through some other kanji. It's like six degrees of Kevin Bacon, but with kanji. So if you want to visualize the kanji in this case, you have to take subgraphs, like I showed you before. So you have several options. Um, I'm going to show you subgraphing by high-seq lessons. So if you remember, the high-seq data set divides all the kanji up into lessons of about 20 or more kanji. So we're just going to look at one of those lessons. So here, we take a subgraph of lesson 17 and then plot it. And this graph looks like this. So this is already something that you can visualize and reason about. Then you can add labels to this graph. Oops. And there's a little bit of um, matplotlib magic happening here, but if you want to have a look at the sl uh, slides later, I'll show you. Basically, this adds labels, and you get a graph like this. What you can then do is start focusing on each node in the graph and seeing what kanji it's related to. So for example, if you look at the stop, uh, kanji, which is in the middle here, you can see it's related to all these other kanji. And if you want to look at the month, you can see it's related to all these other kanji. Now, in Jupyter, it's a little bit difficult to do interactive stuff, so you can make an interactive web app that looks like this. Here's one I prepared earlier. And uh, again, you can navigate from the stop kanji to any of the related kanji. So for example, let's have a look at walk. So it includes stop here at its top, and at its bottom it's connected to the few kanji. And then you can have um, stuff that's related to it in other ways. Quite often you'll get to um, components that look like this. They're connected to many nodes, and this is because this is a common uh, part 
It's like, it, it's, uh, what's referred to as a radical. Here's an example of another uh, radical. So, lots of kanji, right? So we can zoom out. Yeah, there's a lot of them there. But this sort of visualization helps you see the relationships between kanji. And when you're studying them together, it becomes possible to reinforce um, related uh, kanji through its sort of neighbors. It can also sort of tell you how to uh, focus on uh, individual groups of kanji. So if we go back to lesson 17 of HiSig, the previous example, if you visually do a comp uh, connected component analysis, you can see, well, I can study these kanji together, and I can study these ones together, and so on. So it's a useful uh, tool. Okay, so this brings me to the uh, conclusion of the presentation. The stuff we talked about today, um, we had a very brief introduction to kanji and some of the resources that you can use uh, with Python, like HiSig, KRAD, Chise, and then we looked at basic graph theory and how to connect um, graph theory, uh, resources, and kanji with Python. So um, there's other stuff I want to do in this direction. Uh, I want to look at uh, the pronunciation between kanji because they often share pronunciation and you can use that to group them in a graph. Um, but that, of course, requires you to know how to pronounce them, so it's, um, it requires knowledge of Japanese or Chinese or which, whichever language you choose. And then there's also the issue of uh, ambiguous keywords, like some keywords that sound about the same or they almost mean the same thing. So this one's exceed and this one's overtake. And the really unhelpful thing is in Japanese. They're both koiru. So that's koiru and that's koiru. So remembering them, even if you know Japanese, can be a bit tricky. Same thing goes for things like income, earnings, and salary. They can mean the same thing to um, different people and so on. Uh, there's also an application to words because, again, you can combine kanji to make separate words, and that's also uh, a useful relationship. And then uh, I can also introduce direct and graphs to establish hierarchical relationships between complicated, uh, simple kanji at the top and then moderately complicated kanji that use a simple kanji on the bottom and really hard kanji at the end. And if you want to work on this together, by all means, talk to me. I'm really interested about this stuff. Um, it's my hobby, so it'll be fun. So before I leave you, if you want to have a look at the slides, um, they're here on my GitHub page. That's my GitHub profile. Uh, Jupyter Notebook is also there. And if you want to play around with the um, demo of the graph, that's available at that URL. Um, that's all. Uh, thank you for listening. Go say chill. Arigato gozaimashita. Okay. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Mihail. Uh, do you have a question and comment? Okay. Hi, Mihail. Thank you for that presentation. It's really cool what you're doing with kanji. Um, just wondering with the, the chi, is it chise? I, I think it's chise. Chise, okay. Um, is there a built in nested hierarchy? Like, yes. like the top part? Okay, so there's Yeah, an it, order it is to nested. It. So I had to unnest it to perform the search. Okay. Um, but it's easier to unnest than nest, right? So they went with that option, which is pretty wise, I think. Oh, uh, okay. And my follow up question is. Um, are there any dictionaries already with APIs that group common meanings of kanjis together? Or? I haven't seen APIs. There's a similar gra uh, effort to do graphs, which has started from last year. It's called uh, Kanji Map. So it does a very similar thing to the graph that I showed at the end. Okay. Um, the dictionaries, they tend to be a bit old because they kind of started working on them in uh, 20, 30 years ago, so it's pretty much a flat text file, uh, mm -hmm. which is zipped, and it has like field separators which tell you uh, what the meaning is, how many strokes there are, etc. But the dictionaries are very, they, they're complete. They're yeah. just not accessible via an right. API. But I these see. things weigh about two yeah. or three megs in data, so you just download them and use them inside your app or I write see. your own API. It's not hard. It's not, like, yeah, because I, I don't know in the language 
how complex synonyms can become. I work with English, uh -huh. and synonyms give me a hard time. When I'm oh, yes. Yeah. So there's, um, if I'm not confusing things, there's, uh, is there a word map data set which connects me uh, semantic meaning to words, and you yeah. can use it to compare uh, synonyms, but it's, I've tried applying it to uh, the keywords, and didn't get very good results, so it's still a work in progress. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'd love to follow up later. Yeah, man, let's catch up. Yeah, cool, thanks. Okay, uh, last one, one question. Uh, do you have uh, any question and a comment? Okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mihail.